Hello, I'm Karen Jones and welcome to this series of podcasts where I talk to the movers and shakers of the Welsh economy. What's their background? What are they doing now? And how do they see the future for their business and the future of Wales? I'm delighted to be joined today by Roger Lewis. Uh, Roger is somebody who perhaps needs no introduction. He's held a number of senior posts over the years. Uh, in Decca, in Classic FM, uh, Great Western Radio, uh, and ultimately, of course, ITV Wales, and perhaps uh, most famously of all, Group Chief Executive of the Welsh Rugby Union and the Millennium Stadium, the man with the tickets. Roger, you're very welcome. Good to have you on the programme. Diolch fawr, Carwyn. Now, Roger, a lot of people will know of your history in business, but tell us a bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, and how you came to uh, come into the, the music business, and then of course, go off to, uh, to the Welsh Rugby Union and ultimately, of course, as well, to the airport and other things. Well, I, I suppose I'm a, a back in Kevin Cribble. I'm a boy from Kevin Cribble and I was born in Seaview, which is directly opposite the common in Kevin. And of course, uh, way back when, and in the 50s and the 60s, that was uh, the rugby ground of, of Kevin Cribble Rugby Club. I should say, Kem Kribu Athletic Club, to be more precise, yeah. before it moved over to Kai Golf. Um, and uh, it was the village, really, that I think defined me. Um, uh, the culture of the village, the people of the village, the community of the village. Um, that with the local school of Config Comprehensive. Um, I went to Config in 1966, so I was born in 1954, I'll be 65 this year. And it was that, dare I say, a cultural tolerance that existed within the village, where it was a mining village. Arba Biden was the mine behind. My father was a charger driver in the steelworks. Uh, we were surrounded by miners, as I say, but my father was a blast furnace man. Uh, and within the village, there was a sense of what were the things that were important. And I think that was defined by uh, that post-war consensus about education, opportunity, that cultural tolerance where the choir would sit alongside the rugby club, would sit alongside the Amateur Dramatic Society, the local art society, the WI, the local Labour Party, which was very active in Kevin Kribu. Uh, and they were all part of this one community. And you could express yourself and do what you thought was right, and you'd be encouraged to do that by your parents. And my parents were always incredibly encouraging. Now, uh, here's a question for you. Do people live in Kevin Kribble or on Kevin Kribble? It's a big debate, isn't it? It is a debate. Kevin Kribble, <laughs> as you know, it could be defined as the back of the ridge. And it yeah. is one long road that uh, ascends from Kenfig Hill, where we rise above Kenfig Hill and Pyle and Canelli, and then heads down into Abba Kenfig and Tondee. Um, I think you're very much, I think you live in Kevin Kribble. You absolutely immerse yourself in Kevin. Now, you went off to Nottingham University to study music. Was there music in the family? Yes, there was, actually. But my mother and my father both left school at the age of 14. Uh, my father, originally from Pontre de Ven, and, uh, and then he moved to Patalbert. And uh, as I say, he left school at 14, but had a passion for music because within his house, there was always a piano. Uh, likewise, my mother always sung. And there's photographs of her in the, in the, in the choir in Kenfigill, where the, the then chorus master was uh, uh, Isaias Isaias. The, the father of Edward Isaias, who was the father Undertaker, of John Isaias, the Undertaker, yeah. that's right. Uh, and so th there was music in the family, and there was a piano at home. My father also played the organ in the local chapel, Nebo, Nebo Welsh Baptist Chapel in Kevin Crubble. Kevin Crubble was blessed with uh, a number of pubs and a number of chapels. <laughs> uh, and it li literally, was, there was Wesleyan Chapel at the start of the village. You went further. There was Nebo, the Baptist Chapel. There was Siloam, the Welsh Congregational Chapel. You went further, further east, and you got to Calvary, the English Baptist Chapel. Chapel, and then at, then at the very end of the village, there was the Church of England, which is now the Church of Wales. <laughs> but that, 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 again, that cultural mix was, uh, and that music mix was, was prevalent. But I tell you what, what was fundamental for me was going to Config, and I say Config Comprehensive 1966 was the model comprehensive school. It was uh, the languages that were taught there, Greek, Latin, <coughs> French, German, uh, but then also uh, the sciences that were taught there, uh, all the range of sciences, the range of mathematics. Great sport. I had two great rugby teachers in Paul Davis and Ralph Evans, uh, both playing first-class rugby in, in Wales. But we had an inspirational music teacher, Alan James. And I still go to see Alan. Alan is now in old folks' home down in Skewen, and I go to see Alan. He's, and he was inspirational. Do you know what? In my first year in school, he staged four performances, fully staged, with an orchestra of Mozart's opera, The Marriage of Figaro. Extraordinary. The following year, they did Purcell's Die Duel in Aeneas. Now, in a, in a comprehensive school that drew its pupils from Kevin, Kenfig Hill, Connelly and Pilot. It was inspirational. So Nottingham and then uh, various routes towards Radio 1. 
uh, and Decca, and then to Classic FM. A bit of a leap from Radio 1 to Classic FM. Yeah, how it happened was that I went to, to university in Nottingham, and I still remember, I was, I was quite a, a shy Welsh boy going up there. Uh, it was my first experience outside of Wales, that was 1973, and I still remember my hall residence the first night. A Geordie, of all things, said, Why away, Taffy, do you want some coal in your room to make you feel at home? And I, literally, I could have thumped him. Because, A, I'd never been called Taffy in my life before. Yeah. And the idea of being that association with Cole is something I became very proud of in the end. But uh, at university, I, I grew. I grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, and and uh, I immersed myself in music making. And, um, and and I really got the bug. And after university, I worked as a professional musician for, uh, for, for four years, uh, writing um, for theatre and performing. Uh, my base was London. I rehearsed choirs for the proms in 1977, 1979. But then I wrote about seven um, uh, shows for a theatre company in Bristol. The, the director was Tony Robinson, who later became Baldrick. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you remember, he was also got on the, the national executive of the, the Labour Party as well. Yes. Great guy, Sir Tony Robinson now. And Tony and I worked together for a number of years. Great people there. I also had an Arts Council commission to write a piece for a dance company in Lancaster. I wrote for the Rep in Birmingham and I played piano for the Scottish Ballet. So I did all of that stuff. But as a writing musician, I was asked more and more to write pop music. And because that, that's what theatre wanted. And I found myself drifting into this. Uh, and then, to cut a long story short, I found myself drifting into pop music radio. Uh, and I started off um, presenting rock music on radio tees in the northeast of England. And then I was spotted by London and I was asked to become the um, um, pr- producer of the Breakfast Show on Capital Radio in London, which was, you know, I, I totally surprised me indeed because that was 1984. And that was a, a bit strange because we'd gone through the steel strike in Wales, which my father was on strike as a blast first one. It was something completely redundant, never worked again. And then we went into the miners' strike in 84. And then begin a Welshman in London in Capital Radio at that time. It was quite extraordinary. Uh, but I just immersed myself into it. And Within under a year, I was spotted by the BBC, and I, I was then approached to say, would you consider joining the BBC as a producer to produce The Breakfast Show on BBC Radio 1? So in 85, over, over the road, I went to the BBC, and um, I just, again, immersed myself in that. I did a range of things, not only just producing um, uh, pop music programmes, but I did lots of documentaries. So I did uh, uh, documentaries on um, Madonna, on Bob Geldof, on Tina Turner, uh, on Wham. But then I spent a, a whole year working with Eric Clapton and did the Eric Clapton story, six hours of documentary on the BBC. And gosh, I was then um, approached to become a producer of BBC TV, but the BBC turned around and said, stay at Radio 1, and I became head of music. So I became head of music at okay. BBC Radio 1. I mean, if we went through your entire CV, we'd be here a long time because it's uh, you've done so many things. But uh, you left Radio 1 in 1990, uh, became president of DECA, managing director of EMI, eight years there. Uh, and then uh, 98 to 2004, managing director and program controller for Classic FM, director of GWR. And then back to Wales in 2004 as the managing director of ITV Wales. What was the um, the reason for the move back home? Oh, it- there was always a desire to return to Wales, and I started formulating this in the 90s. And as you say, I joined EMI, first of all, as the managing director of the classical division of EMI in 1990. <laughs> uh, and that was fascinating because my classical background, having then spent 10 years in pop music radio, I caught the wave when, of course, it was Pavarotti singing Ness and Dorma at the 1990 Soccer World Cup, Nigel Kennedy, who I worked with for about six, seven years with the, the Vivaldi Four Seasons. Um, I, I caught that wave, and that wave took off, and I was very lucky because the record business was blooming and blossoming in those days. Uh, and so followed the wave, and I realised that things were going well. Um, and I thought we'd start a plan for when I hit 50 in 2004, come what may, we'd go home to Wales. Um, I went into Decca and then realised at Decca in 1998 that the record business was heading for the rocks because we'd all realised that digitisation was the future and these vertically integrated businesses of um, um, making CDs, selling CDs, distributing CDs all across the world in big, big monolithic um, uh, structures was was going to collapse because digitization meant you could make great records at home in your bedroom. You know, at EMI, we had Abbey Road and we had Capital in uh, Studios in, in Hollywood, which, I, which both of which I worked in regularly with Decca uh, and Polygram. We are the biggest record company in the world, owned by Philips, you know, the big uh, electronics, Dutch electronics company. So I started the plan then. Um, and luckily, 
to to take my career forward and my, my passion for, for music and, and you know, creating that access to it. I had the opportunity with Classic FM, we went to great heights there. But come 2004, again, there was a big transformation taking place within radio, where GWR, which I was a director, was a, P, a publicly limited company, we had 40 radio stations in the UK, was then going through a change, and it merged with Capital Radio, which I'd also worked in the early 80s, was going through a big change, a big merger, and I thought that was the moment, that was the moment to step out. And luckily, again, purely by like on my career, I've been very fortunate that you know the, the, the waves are broken at certain times. Was that um, I want to get back to Wales. We bought the house in Wales, we'd already bought it, uh, planned it. I set up myself um, um, a portfolio of non executive directorships. I was the deputy chairman of Boozy and Hawks, I was the uh, uh, director of a, a capital uh, company in, in London, I was the chairman of the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra, I was on Liverpool Capital Culture, and also I run a number of charities as well, which was so important to me, uh, which perhaps we might talk about. Um, is that uh, I came back to become Managing Director of ITV in Wales, which was a challenge because I knew the transformation that ITV was going through. And that was really tough because it was a rear guard action to try and keep Calvert House Cross open and try and create as a hub for the creative arts. And we, we got part of the way there and I managed to buy all of the land around for ITV as part of this creative hub, but ITV were perhaps a bit more hard-nosed in it all, and they had a view that they wanted to reduce uh, the, their, their footprint significantly across all of the UK, not just Wales. Uh, and sure enough, they then sold the land and moved ITV into the bay. And that was really tough because I really felt the vision we had for Calvary's Cross was a really exciting one, and we could have retained those facilities, and we'd also purchased land further to, 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 the, to the south of the site, as it were. Um, but it wasn't to be, uh, and but there I was at, at, at ITV Wales, and all of a sudden the phone rang one day by a search consultant uh, saying, would I be interested in considering the role of Group Chief Executive of the Welsh Rugby Union? <laughs> yes, and we'll come out to that in a second. Before we, we go on to that, let's um, just talk a little bit about the charities that yeah. uh, you've been involved with. I mean, I, I, you and I worked, of course, um, together to try to save the Ogmore Centre, didn't we? Unfortunately, that, that didn't work out. Uh, but you have been involved with uh, with, with a number of charities, uh, and uh, you know, you've mentioned a few of them there. I mean, of the charities you've been involved in, which are the ones perhaps that are particularly close to your heart? Oh, the Ogmo, without doubt, and it hurts so much. I, I still feel hurt and bruised about that. And I would pay tribute to Ros Williams, who was the director there, because uh, Ros also fought so hard. Uh, and what we did, we created a limited company. We took over the centre. We ran the centre very effectively. Uh, and we had a future. We had a vision for it. And dare I say, we were let down. We were let down badly by the local authority because we could have maintained the centre, the facility, and we had a scheme in place that would have allowed disadvantaged children from disadvantaged backgrounds to have access to it. It would have been a commercial model. But we fought and fought and fought. I did for 10 years, travelling um, from London uh, you know, at, at, at great... Um, uh, physical cost to myself, you know, forget that the money was just, it was just the getting up and down from London so regularly. Uh, and, and that was so important because Ogmo was in our DNA of a certain age. It was, and it was created to, to give opportunities from children from disadvantaged backgrounds in the valleys to come to have almost a holiday experience that was driven by an educational background in the 40s. Again, part of that post, post-war post desire for education for all. Uh, and we fought very hard uh, on that and uh, paid tribute to everyone there, but it wasn't to be. And as we know, the camp then, which we call it the camp, which was for me, you know, where I cut my teeth as a young musician, so many people f f across all of, uh, of South Wales cut their teeth there and that was so important for me but then the other things that, that, that have come to the fore was um, as a businessman I thought how do we encourage other business people to get involved in charitable activities so uh, I was one of the founders of something called the Beacon Foundation for Philanthropy because we haven't got a tradition of philanthropy in, in the UK. And I spent three years working on this. We established it, it still exists. And that is to encourage high net worth individuals and, and, um, and blue chip companies to, to, to contribute significantly to charitable causes. We launched it at 11 Downing Street by then Chancellor Gordon Brown. And one of the major recipients was Bob Geldof for all the work that he did. And Bob, I'd worked with Bob and Bob was hugely supportive, but a range of people were celebrated and and encouraged as exemplars to give something back to society. So that, that was really important. And more recently, the, 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 the charities that I'm very actively involved in, one is called Compass for Life, and we did some great work in Sandfields a couple of weeks ago. And Compass for Life is 
run by a brilliant, inspirational man called Floyd Woodrow. Floyd is a former major, heavily decorated major in the Special Air Service, in the SAS, spent his whole career in the military, uh, was awarded uh, the, 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 the Queen's Gallantry Medal. Uh, and uh, what we do with Compass for Life is to give children from disadvantaged backgrounds a sense of purpose and we work with schools in disadvantaged areas to give children the opportunities that certainly I had in Kevin Kribble and Canfig and perhaps no longer so obvious today. So that is number one. And the second one is I, I, I chair a military foundation, I established it, a military foundation which looks after a particular special unit in Wales and we primarily look after their welfare needs because it's a unit that went through a great uh, uh, trauma and experience in, in, in Afghanistan and, and I work with that as well. Let's move on to your position as Group Chief Executive of the WIU, probably the position that you were uh, most well known for. And uh, I remember when I first uh, heard the news, I was surprised because, of course, your background was music, uh, the business of music, and then straight into the business of sport at a time when the WIU was not in a particularly strong uh, position. You mentioned that uh, you were um, headhunted uh, for the position. What do you think were the main challenges for you as somebody who had had a strong background in the music industry, then moving into something that was quite different? Well, the first was most probably uh, an emotional challenge because throughout all of my life, rugby was my passion. Born opposite the, the rugby ground in Kevin Cribble. Uh, played rugby at a, a very modest level in school, but absolutely loved my rugby play in school. Played rugby at university. And then with my two sons in, in, uh, in, in England, I took an active part in Maidenhead Rugby Club from literally from the under fives to the under 19s and both my sons played rugby actually with with great distinction uh, in fact my eldest son Owen played alongside James Haskell in the uh, Colts uh, under 19s at Maidenhead and they, they got to a, a semi-final in England on that Tom was a really outstanding outside half and both played rugby up until their early 30s so my big challenge was how do I consider moving into rugby which has been my personal private passion and personal release outside of the music business and um, my first reaction was no way no way and there's a dear friend of mine called Steve Jones who's the Sunday who was the rugby correspondent mm. of the Sunday Times yeah, and I was in his kitchen because we we were both involved in Maidenhead Rugby Club together for the best part of gosh it must have been almost 20 years and Steve said you've got to go for it you've got to go for it um I looked at the business and I discussed it with my business colleagues, particularly with the partners who were in Barchester, who were financially very, very astute. And we, we poured over the accounts and they said, it's bust. Don't be so daft. The model is bust. So they looked at it forensically for me. And uh, it, it was in, you know, people don't appreciate this. And so there was a lot of spin and hot air saying that, it, but it really was um, a distressed, officially declared by the bank, a distressed organization. So what that meant was that it couldn't do anything without the agreement in advance of the bank. So any monies that it generated, any potential services had to go towards, had to go towards uh, uh, um, what, what the bank thought best. Um, so that was the biggest challenge because everyone forgets in 2007, the WRU put in a loss. It was a loss-making enterprise. The debt on the stadium uh, at that moment in time, it was not clear how that debt would be managed. And if we had a significant uh, wind of change coming through, we would be really on our uppers. And there was talk at that time of uh, selling the stadium, wasn't it? Oh, I was approached in my first few months, and I won't say by whom actually, <laughs> of the opportunity of securitizing future income from the sales, uh, from the, the, from access to tickets. <laughs> it was a very leading businessman in Wales. Uh, and luckily, uh, luckily, um, myself and my great finance director, Steve Phillips, saw through this. And we thought, no, this, uh, this was a, a short-term measure that would be absolutely disastrous for the Welsh rugby of his long-term uh, long uh, uh, sustainability. So basically what we did, and how did I make that transfer? How I saw... The Welsh Rugby Union is how I looked at the at, at the music business. And bear in mind, I worked with, uh, you know, some of the greatest names, great world names in in uh, in, in, in music. You know, I worked with Luciano Pavarotti for two years. I worked with the three tenors. I worked with Nigel Kenny. I worked with Simon Rattle, Cecilia Bartoli. But also worked with Paul McCartney. I worked with the likes of Eric Clapton and George Harrison and people like this. And I saw our rugby players as great stars. Our coaches as producers. Our stadium as a studio. But then we had to create content with our great players, our great coaches, 
in a recording studio, which was the Millennium Stadium, and then broadcast it to the world because the biggest driver of commercial revenue for the Welsh Rugby Union are its media rights. And that was the biggest driver, backed up then by a base of ticketing income, but backed up by our sponsorship opportunity. So the model of working with elite performers in music to work with elite performers in, in rugby with great coaches, and for me, Warren Gatlin was our Steven Spielberg. He was the man who made the magic happen. Uh, and then you needed to create your systems and structures around the support. Hence, with the great support of the Welsh Government, we, we built, and again, people perhaps may forget this, we built the finest training facilities for rugby in the world. That was our Abbey Road, well, what we created up at the Vale with the support of, of Welsh Government inside the, the building and outside the building, but then also the further investment working with Welsh Government to invest in the screens, the pitch, because what we did was articulate that not only was this so important for Wales in terms of, in terms of our Welsh DNA, but also as a driver of economic benefit for Cardiff and for all of Wales and to put Wales on the map. You mentioned there the, the way that that you saw the WIU and, and your vision for it. And you mentioned, of course, the the elite players, the professional game, which is important because it's the income driver for the uh, for the rest of the game. But of course, then you have the base, the amateur game, the clubs. How do you get the balance right between uh, making sure that you, are, you give enough support to the money generating side, while at the same time being able to support sufficiently the, the community clubs who've got the players who just play, they're not, they're not going to be playing at the, at, the highest le- at the highest level. In some ways, they're two different sports in that sense, aren't they? But what's, what's the challenge in terms of getting the balance right between the two? Again, I, I was. Um, uh, it's interesting looking back because a lot of people at, in the l- l- latter stage of my uh, career there uh, criticised me for just being focused on the top end. But if you look at where we put the investment in the enterprise, uh, we invested heavily in grassroots rugby. Uh, and we also created systems and structures in grassroots rugby. And we instigated our schools programme. The problem that we all face within sport in Wales, within volunteering in Wales, within active activity within in Wales outside of um, outside of our businesses is is more fundamental uh, because what was taking place within rugby clubs was was something that dare I say its roots were back in the 80s where um, the, the teaching of rugby in schools had changed fundamentally as the teaching of music has changed fundamentally in schools since since those early eighties. Um, the the role of the rugby club it, within within the villages has changed. Uh, people's desire to play sport ha- has changed because the demands on people's leisure time, activity time are far greater. So we, we recognise this in in the WIU, and we did invest very very heavily in, in a whole range of schemes to put money into the sharp end of the sport. So we had a, a participation points scheme, which was to reward those clubs who are getting kids into the game, reward those clubs who are putting more teams on the pitch Uh, and we then also uh, invested in pitches and clubhouses but most uh, uh, fundamentally and radically was we invested in people to go into schools to coach rugby Um, but of course we had three demands on us we had to sort the debt out, we had to create a win in Wales which drove the revenue for all of rugby in Wales Um, we had to then address the position of the four regions who were um, were, uh, working in professional um, rugby throughout uh, throughout Europe and then of course the grassroots scheme so many many mouths to feed and uh, it's, it's almost dare I say mission impossible Given the given the economic um, challenges that we all face in Wales, but we mustn't give up on that mission, and that is the mission for the WRU, and that's what they're continuing to to fight and argue today. Let's move on to the airport. Uh, you became the the chair of Cardiff Airport. Um, a very wise decision was taken to to buy the airport, of course, <laughs> uh, which at that time was on its knees. Uh, we've seen it develop very strongly. Difficult news with 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 Flyby and uh, what what happened there, which I know is is a, an issue in in Flyby itself. We've seen the airport grow. We saw, I mean, Qatar Airways obviously was a very very important uh, investment uh, into the uh, into the airport. If I could ask you about the future of, uh, of Cardiff Airport, where, where do you see the airport developing in the future? What are the main opportunities? Well, well let me give you an immediate headline, particularly in the context of the changes that are recently taking place. For the first quarter of this year, uh, that's April, May, June of, of 2019, we've increased our passengers by 10% year on year. And we're forecasting 
um, uh, the, the growth between now and next year, even with the flyby changes, of at least 7%. And I think it'll be greater now than 7%. So the good news is, you know, we'd planned for, and we continually plan at the airport for a, a, any of the, the, the changes. Uh, what I would say to Welsh Government, and, and I, I paid tribute to yourself, Carwin, you, you took the decision to purchase Cardiff Airport. It was an incredibly brave decision. Well, I've got to say that now, six years on, anyway, rather than at the time. Yeah, the, yeah, the words brave always frightened politicians. You know, uh, but it was. <laughs> It was brave, and you got you you got a lot of stick for it. And you know the purchase price of fifty two million is now seen today as a great as a great deal, um, because we we have continually grown. We've grown something like over sixty percent since um, since Welsh government purchased it in two thousand and thirteen, um, and we are continuing to forecast growth even without changes because the airline business is incredibly dynamic. It it doesn't stand still, and everyone must recognise this. So airlines come, airlines go in all of air, air, airports, and it's the skill of the executive and the board to continually manage for uh, for those changes. So the future of Cardiff Airport, I'm very positive about because the opportunity for further growth, significant growth, is there. You know, over a million people from our direct catchment area still travel to Bristol. Over a million people from our direct catchment area still travel down the M4 to Heathrow and Gatwick. So the opportunity for growth is considerable. We've, we've analysed it so carefully in terms of where are the opportunities for growth. And that was behind our pitch to Qatar Airways because they spotted this and that's been successful uh, and that has been very successful and that is growing. So what's the future of Cardiff Airport? We will continue to continue to offer our the, our catchment area are people in Wales and wider than Wales now because Qatar Airways gives us a catchment area that goes way beyond uh, our immediate catchment area of South West, South East Wales. It goes down to um, South West United Kingdom, it goes to the edges of, of London, it goes to the edges of Birmingham because we're the only airport that offers a scheduled flight to the Gulf and beyond. That's the most important thing. But as well as cont continue to improve our passenger offering, the this is what makes it so unique with our relationship with the Welsh Government, is how do we create this as a hub for a range of activity? So the relationship with the British Airways maintenance centre has been fundamental. We fought, worked hand in glove with British, with Welsh Government to ensure that facility stays. And that facility now has got the contract for the Dreamliner 787 within the British Airways fleet. That's fantastic. And we've also explored with British Airways how we can consider other partners coming to, to that facility. But then we're working with the educationalists and the educational establishments and institutions that how we can create a hub for education within aerospace and aviation in the area. And recently, Welsh Government asked us to take on the management of St. Athen as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an airfield. Uh, and the opportunity for growth there is considered Considerable. So I, I'm very uh, optimistic and bullish about the future of Cardiff Airport because we are now ideally located to develop the site into all manner of ways, an education park, a business park, uh, and what else could be done there is very exciting for, for Wales. Well, Roger, we could, uh, we could talk for a long, long time, I'm sure. Uh, you now, of course, have moved on to become the president of the National Museum. And that's something I know that uh, is a, a great interest of yours. Perhaps uh, at some point in the future we can talk about that. One last question from me. Uh, you've given away your age, 65 this year. Uh, you've told us a lot of what you've done in the past, and we've, we've just touched on that. There's a lot more to it. Still very, very active. So I'm going to ask you the question that lots of people have asked me, uh, because they know that, that I know you, and that is, do you ever sleep? <laughs> oh, I, 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 I'm lucky. I, I think I've inherited my father's and my mother's genes. My mother's still alive. She's 92, living in Kevin Krubu on her own now because my dad passed away. Um, my my great 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 grandmother lived to over a hundred, and that was pretty remarkable in, in the 19th century. Um, so I, I perhaps I'm blessed with some good Welsh genes. Uh, most probably coming from from uh, from a, a hard, good, honest, working class background. Um, so uh, hey, my ambition is to, to give everything to Amgoyth Cymru and that's all about inspiring people and changing lives for Wales and I'm so honoured and privileged and proud to uh, have been appointed President of the National Museum of Wales because I think that is so important for the future of Wales. Can I give you one statistic? More learning takes place outside of the classroom in Wales in the National Museum of Wales than anywhere else. And it's a joy to go to Llanberis, to go to Drivach, to go to Pwll Mawr, to go to St. Fagans, to go to Caerleon, to go to Swansea, and to go to Cardiff here and see mums, dads, grandmothers, 
grandfathers, children, so many children coming through the doors and being inspired by the by by our uh, our great past, which we celebrate in Wales, but encourage them to take a part in shaping the future of a new Wales. And that's why I think Amgoyfa Cymru is so exciting for Wales because it's leveraging not only the soft power of Wales, which is so important, but creating a vivid, dynamic, immersive learning experience outside of the classroom so for so many children. And for me, it comes full circle for my career. Uh, to do this and and that's why I, 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 I'm giving it everything I can for the next four years so it'll take me up to 69 and then perhaps I'll draw breath thereafter well Roger Lewis not ready for the garden yet as you can see still very very active and uh, lots of plans for the future Roger it's been a pleasure having you uh, on the uh, podcast best of luck for the future and uh, I'm sure there are many many more opportunities to come for you Roger Don't Lewis thanks very much Jeff Walker, right?